in the future. So, first of all, yeah. First of all, the point is, what was actually happening in two hundred, um, yeah, and and fourteen? Uh, signs of the uh, doom. Winter Olympic Games started in, in Russia, but one of the five rings of the Olympic symbol was broken. <laughs> Maybe some omen. Uh, Emma Watson addressed the UN Assembly talking about gender equality. Of course, it was already a problem, but I mean. Since then, it has been uh, strongly emphasized. And uh, then, of course, virus, N not our virus, but a virus, and the, the youngest Nobel Prize for uh, peace. So, all things, and the, many other things happened, such as, you know, whatever, actors and singers, but I mean, we don't care about this. The point could be what's going, what happened actually in the meantime. So, in the 10 years, between Berlin and us. And we can say, of course, many things that were in part unexpected. Trump won unexpectedly. Brexit passed unexpectedly. Syria was destroyed. Ukraine was invaded. Middle East are still <laughs> keep fighting with different um, kind of styles, but I mean, they keep fighting. And the important news for us, not that these before are not important, but this is the most important for everybody, pandemic, actually uh, changed radically our view of the world. Because until the pandemic, I mean, just sticking on, on heritage and cultural management, the point was, we will find money, somebody will pay for it, don't worry, something will rescue us, etc. So there was the idea of, you know, in some way, uh, pushing ahead the agony of the cultural system, saying something will take care of us. Pandemic eliminated all the destroyed, all the justifications or excuses or alibis. So at the end of the day, maybe we should acknowledge that the world is different, maybe is being different for 30 years, but now we're starting, we can't do anymore any in our game to say, but maybe we can go back to whatever, and so it doesn't work. So the point is, let's describe our world so we can have a map. If we describe a world, we can say, certainly we have a global network where knowledge is being created, crafted, and diffused. Of course, we know it. Then a common language we're using, of course, in a very uneven kind of style, but we do. And of course, in these last 10 years, we've had unexpected realm for new inventions. Nobody could expect, for example, that a drone could deliver an Amazon book or kill the enemy. It, it does both, and it does eff well, effective, well, effectively force in the battle. So the point is, it's something we couldn't really expect. You send self-driving cars, blah, blah, blah. But think about it carefully. Actually, the point is, the network where monasteries, where knowledge were created, crafted, and distributed, the common language was Latin, and the unexpected realm for new inventions was exactly the space the room where they invented sextant, astrolabe, whatever it is. So, a new world. A new world in which everything was started from a destruction of the Roman Empire and migrations, etc. And then at the end of the day, they discovered America, so they had a completely new view of the world. This is quite important for us because this puts us finally, finally, in a wonderful Middle Ages. We've been taught that Middle Ages was an obscure time where actually well, there was, you know, whatever it is, violence, blah, blah, blah. Okay, we know. But think about our world. Uncertain borders, migrations, new formats of war and peace. Russia is um, combining two formats of war. One is the barbarian one, destroy everything. The other is uh, the subtle war they are playing through fake news, associations, spreading dissent, etc. So it's combining these. And this, of course, given the absence of the internet or whatever it is, of communication, or even of too many people living in the world, it was not possible then. But it's exactly what they are inventing in the Middle Ages, crafting new war machines. Then, of course, there's a clash between hope and fear. You know, the future American elections are exactly a clash between hope and fear, however you may interpret them. Um, bowling formats. Bowling means out of the box, which is something we will come back to. It's important to say that the art is not located in mainstream places such as museums, etc. So uh, I remember 
uh, for the Ministry of Italy was saying, a uh, guy from Florence comes back from the uh, 15th century, comes back to the earth in Florence, and he looks, he recognizes the town and meets a passerby and say, uh, can you tell me who are the creative people in this town? And he answers, of course, but, but we have many, Brunelleschi, Michelangelo, Giotto, and say, no, these were my time. Now, who are the creative ones? And maybe he couldn't answer because there are not any more uh, official, you know, conventional creative people. They are hidden somewhere. So this is it. And I must say, the point is, who were the people actually creating the content in the Middle Ages? There were those called the Clerici Vagantes, which are the wandering scholars. Wandering scholars, in, in, in the Italian language, errante means wandering, but also making mistakes. So it's something like inventing the path, creating trails. There were scholars even involved in the performing arts, so they were mixing together wisdom, writing, reading, and also possibly performing, singing, dancing, uh, playing instruments, etc. <laughs> Everywhere in Europe. And they were actually uh, creating the backbone of the vision of Europe. It's us. I know it may sound ambitious, but it's us. We have, in some way, a commitment, which is let's interpret the world as they were doing during the Middle Ages. Because now we lost, fortunately, all the boxed um, you know, conventions, hierarchical, taxonomic, whatever it is, um, map of the world. So it's time to draw a different map. And this is it. Now we should interpret heritage. Uh, I know that heritage, as Eliot was say, saying yesterday, is an ambiguous word because it contains many things, including a big being rooted in the past, but also some meaning for us. So heritage as a tomb to be protected is something not only tedious, but of course it's not exerting any value. So our problem is how can we generate value from heritage? So we don't need stones, but knowledge. I can keep a Roman monument buried everywhere, but if I keep it buried, no knowledge will be developed. So we'll transmit to next generation stones, not knowledge. So be careful about the idea of protecting things and not their content. And of course, it's not ethical. <coughs> Whoever thinks that culture and art are ethical is simply not observing reality. I have a blacklist of people I really would kill that read novels, uh, love movies, blah, 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 blah visit museums. I mean, this doesn't transform them into nice people. So don't be so stupid to imagine that culture is given to creating other sort of superheroes or whatever. It's not special. Special means nobody can, care of, can take care of it. Only, you know, uh, uh, experts. It's specific. If we are able to describe specificities of art and culture, maybe we can have something like a toolbox to work on. And of course, it's not memory, it's vision. Memory is something quite odd. Uh, in the 19th century, the idea of memory is, of course, the muses, the giving name of two museums. Muses are the um, children, the daughters uh, of the goddess Mnemosyne. Mnemosyne is the goddess of memory. So the interpretation of museum is something, it's deposits of memory you have the duty to keep. Now, after all these changes, maybe Mnemosyne is a goddess, it's not stupid. She looks ahead and say, it's crafting a discourse that's worth remembering tomorrow. So we are crafting future memory, not keeping past memory, which is changing 180 degrees of view. I back this idea, maybe we can discuss about this, but I think we can't do without. And the more we keep in a way steady and mummified on the past, the more we are dead, and there's no idea of generating any more value. <coughs> so, once heritage was everywhere, that's important, the geography of heritage. Uh, art cities were cities where you can st could stumble at every step in something artistic. The shape of the buildings, decoration, paintings, sculptures, statues, monuments, whatever it is. Now, art is in some way put, uh, deposited in wonderful ivory towers because the bourgeoisie needed a past. Until uh, Bastille, uh, until the French Revolution, um, kings and feudal lords were in some way authorized by God. 
Still now, Charles III in Great Britain has the, in the pound coin that's written Charles III DG, which means De Grazia, by grace of God. So without a naturalization of God, he would have been king. When the bourgeoisie takes over and they create a wonderful word, capitalism, blah, 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 and they are rich, creative, aggressive, uh, even with not that many prejudices, at the end of the day, they need some authorization. And they invent the past. Napoleon, who was actually my cover slide, but <laughs> it was the statue of Napoleon. Napoleon was uh, bringing in Egypt more archaeologists than soldiers. The campaign in Egypt, it was 1797. It was a disaster from a military point of view, but he stole whatever he could and brought it to the Louvre. Although there were no connections whatsoever between ancient Egypt and modern France, but he needed a past. This is why we is isolated in temples. It's not by chance that they talk about temples. So in Italy, we have this rhetoric, stupid rhetoric about the Teatro La Scala, which is a wonderful reactionary opera theater. And they say it's a temple of opera. The temple is something, I mean, no, please don't do it. It's really not really smart to see it. So ivory towers are rejecting people. Even the shape, if you visit museums here in Rome, you see the museums are in some way physically and symbolically rejecting you. Only if you're an expert, you are welcome. Otherwise, you better stay home, okay? Which is not, and it's, it's not, not only not convenient, but also in some way losing opportunity. So, and we have a rhetoric which is very stupid. We say invaluable, incomparable, priceless, but we imagine that art is in internal competition. We have a monetary metrics. We have dimensional metrics. Yesterday, 40,000 people visited Italian museums. So what? So even the official, the institutional kind of assessments are in some way muscular. It's like Trump saying, my button is bigger than yours. So it's porn culture at the end of the day, because we are not interested at all in processes, but just in dimensions, which is totally a toxic rhetoric biasing our interpretation of heritage. Because if it's like this, I can do anything at all. Just respect it, you know, ritually, but nothing uh, that can be done. And this, of course, implies that there is a perception of culture bound to failure, because they can't survive in the market according just to simple marketplace rules, which is market is the metrics. Monetary dimensions are the metrics. Culture is totally a different thing. I am not saying that it is intangible. I'm saying a very simple thing. If the semantic consistency of culture works, money will come, but not as a goal or as a metric, but as an effect of sound, consistent and effective management of culture. It's very simple. But of course, to do this, you should destroy the specialized kind of mood of many art historians, um, archaeologists, uh, that, that, that they say, only I can. The others are just, you know, stupid people. They, at, at the maximum, they can put, put a restaurant close to my museum, but it's not their business. We saw this stupid, totally wrong. So we have, at the end of the day, binary contradictions. This is it, the idea of having too many values, because we have monetary values as a symptom and symbol of success in a capitalistic uh, kind of framework. Um, cultural value as spiritual values, blah, blah, which are the opposite. So at the end of the day, you have a clash. So you can't manage it because they are enemies, reciprocally enemies. And it's quite important because it's a clash between incompatible formats. Textbook economics is very mechanical, if then. You make this and you become rich in terms, which is totally wrong. Leah, you don't know how much we missed you, and we were almost phoning to hospitals oh, sorry, to check. Uh, it's, <laughs> don't worry. It's a hell. Don't Roma, worry. It's Roma, it's a hell. It's a, Roma is a stomach, <laughs> which is even worse. A hell. See, it's because of all we visitors, I think. <laughs> Too many visitors. Sorry. Sorry, Leah. Too many visitors. No, 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 it's not. no, 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 it's, in this case it's residents, because they, they are not able, when, when it rains, they are not prepared to it. We, no, no, we were, we were stopped, we stopped for 20 years, and now we are doing all in one year, it's like, it's like on the that. Yeah. Amen. So, so at the end of the day, we have these two conflicting ideas. On one hand, 
the textbook economics, which is based on if then logic. On the other hand, the idea of culture being untouchable, sacred, etc., and aim to rescue in soul. Go back to our blacklist, and we can be certain about this is totally both are fake. Good news is that that society doesn't exist anymore. So we're not anymore in this, you know, like like a, a will coyote kind of, you know, mood of running uh, continuously without acknowledging that there's not any more ground. And, and this is good news. So the, our task is how can we reinterpret? And it's certainly, uh, this also uh, due to the acceleration and dramatization introduced by the pandemic, but it was perceivable even before, it's not anything we discovered from scratch, is A, we have a different idea of time and space. If we are able to use it, time is not anymore a grid in which everything is measured. Imagine the towns where you have the idea, the ritual um, um, worship of capitalism, you have time to work, time to have fun. The idea of separation of free time. Uh, Italo Calvino, Italian writer, was saying something wonderful that's actually is, is um, real in our profession. Isn't, he was saying, in my profession, I can't separate working time by leisure time. I'm always there. I'm always a whole. And that's us. And then, of course, a smoother idea of space. Space is um, hierarchical. I don't want to make you lose much time with my presentation, but I mean, if you have the time to check the wonderful drawing of um, Cedric Price, the city as an egg. Here's something wonderful. The, the ancient city is like the boiled egg because we have center, the white is residence, and the, um, the out part is, is walls, which are not protecting. I mean, they are protecting uh, towns, but maybe they are maybe the most effective means to make you pay the import duty. If you bring commodities to be sold, you need to pay. The capitalistic town is like fried egg, which is not really beautiful to see because the center remains, but the rest is periphery, it's suburbs. Well, periphery means peri from Greek is around it, and ferein means to bring. So we have this idea where slaves are in some way having rest, eating soup, and then going back to the you know chain, the building chain of, of capitalism. The good news is the town of the future, according to Cedric Price, and this was written, it was drawn in 1982, so a lot of time to focus on the future, uh, is crumbled eggs, which means a patchwork with no hierarchies. Now, we are living in this space we act like scrambled eggs. In fact, talents and ferments are not being, you know, in some way um, growing and being fed in the center. They are in an unexpected place, also because it's a multicultural society. Then we have, of course, the idea of a cross-media approach, which is not the idea that um, the internet or the digital things are some sort of prosthetic decoration. We do it both normally. We are doing it in this moment. So uh, digital is, is just an extension. I remember when I was a child and telephone came to my house, my father was complaining about me telephoning because he was saying, if you phone, you say, you see you tomorrow at five, goodbye. I was spending hours making love declaration, uh, arguing with people, oh, whatever. So, I mean, well, it's just extending our channels. And then, of course, uh, culture is not any more hierarchical. The idea of highbrow, lowbrow culture is something typical of the 70s, where there was a social conflict. Now, we, we can't do any, any more. I, I wouldn't say, frankly, there is a lot of bad classical music, a lot of good pop music. So the point is, you know, you can separate by, by labels. And then, of course, the idea is a clash between protection and hybridation. Nationalist states, nationalist culture, sovereignism, whatever it is, Trump, Giorgio Meloni in Italy, they're just protecting whatever they can, even if they don't care about it. The idea is protecting, protecting family. They don't have a family. They don't remember the family it was an OGM. It was in some way uh, uh, generated by society. So family is not natural. It's something that was invented to protect agricultural property. So it's really stupid to see it. And then, of course, in the meantime, many things happen. Talents and ferments emerge because they emerge despite the institutional conventional setting, which is something good for us. So it's time to unearth, unwrap, unformat, and to invade the urban fabric. Some festival is already a good proof of the fact that we can invade the urban fabric. They are not anymore 
limited and in some way protected in central area, they spread through town. And this is quite important for us. So the point is heritage is something more complex, more heterogeneous, and certainly we can't do a map without considering what maybe at this moment are still invisible artists, invisible heritage, even invisible archaeology. Maybe because it's not that important, so they keep it on a second row kind of feeling. And this is so. What can we do? First of all, also business models have been in some way uh, made uh, fragile and weak by these changes because we have a lot of urban spaces being occupied and run by artists, which is generating commons. So the idea is that social groups are generating commons. We are not anymore something, whatever, uh, on paper with stamp and official things. We do it. And we need new municipal policies. You will talk about this. And the point is that certainly the idea of general call for giving you money if you self-assess as creative are something like wasting money, wasting our money. So it's not at all good. And maybe a challenge could be even to ask or to look for in-kind support before monetary support. Many cultural things, including museums, I was a president of a theater in, uh, in L'Aquila a few years ago, and my first dialogue with the mayor was, give me less money, but possibly push the cars in the opposite side of the square, so we don't have an obstacle, a physical obstacle, and a symbolic obstacle, and give me a photovoltaic plant, which is sparing a lot of money and producing my energy, which is, at the end of the day, I would have spent much less. So the point is, uh, rather than considering money as a symbol of prince's approval, maybe I could do a very simple piece of paper and make the notes and the list of what I need. This is, in some way, the idea of, still in the Middle Ages, art has always been subversive. Uh, impressionists were rejected. Art is always uncomfortable. It's always pushing and giving you something like a, a kicking you in the stomach. If it's not, it's not art. When I was um, going around museums with my former child, now he's 18 years old, so doesn't consider me any more alive. But I mean, when it was something like five years old, I was trying to say, okay, we share works of art. And the, the, it is, if you stumble, it's art. If you don't, it's tedious. That is, you need something. Salute putting you in crisis, and this is quite important. So heritage is the fallout of innovations, and the, the real commitment, studying and uh, enjoying and working with heritage is to understand its ramification, its branches toward the future, not just the past. Roots and logs are useful to generate branches. So the point is the future of heritage is quite, quite fundamental. So we can have something like a guidelines for our future, be uh, happy about the idea that maybe we're in an uncertain time, which is a fertile time, that labels are disappearing, that uh, many structures are informal, so not anymore in the way uh, uh, boxable in whatever we already know. Social practices, which is something you improvise, and also the impact on society. Uh, I don't care about the culture generating uh, restaurants, hotels, and transportation, but um, social capital, social inclusion, quality of urban life, allocation of resources, which is quite something that only the arts can do. And then, of course, this implies a design for new public action. Maybe our final product of this conference should contain some guidelines to say, hey, look, governments, you can't do anymore <clears throat> what you did so far, which is simply giving us money to keep us, in some way, uh, uh, silent which is really stupid and really um, um, oppressive, dicta dictatorial. We don't need benevolent dictators. We need a democracy crafted by social practices, which is fundamental. This is it. Okay. <laughs> Hit me. Any remark, question, discussion, blah, blah, blah. Um, Michaela, thank you. That was really, really solid, really great, fantastic beginning, and for today and well and beyond. Um, the last slide um, it made me think about um, 
maybe think about working in an art school and about um, when, when I did this and when I had the opportunity, I um, began also a design degree at the same art school yeah. for a few reasons. Because selling um, art social practice, and so some of the practices were definitely art for art's sake, good, um, art with social practice, yeah, but design was seen much more as having the capacity in the minds of the university as a vocational capacity and also to connect much more with social practice and um, external projects, yeah? yeah? In other words, I hate to say this, be more useful, good. but for me it was strategic to begin this degree. It's now called the School of Art and Design. And I just wonder um, if there's uh, that distinction in, in Italy or other places between art and design. Well, it's certainly more beneficial, so it's okay, it's okay. So uh, useful, beneficial, certainly. Uh, the idea is, I mean, we uh, uh, sometimes talk about design thinking, etc. But I mean, the risk is they use uh, something like pre-cooked protocols and you in some way apply to whatever it is. See. So design is something, uh, I mean, I would say we have two elements which are, on one hand, artists do something not because they have a goal, yeah. but because they can't do without. Yeah. Yeah. So they express an urgency. It's not by chance that artists don't talk. Yeah. Uh, I like to write and I have a novel at half point and I don't manage to uh, fucking go on because the idea is I need to, to suffer. See. Otherwise, I can't. Since I talk even even too much, See. the point is I express myself with language. My See. student yesterday, my degree student in Venice, wasn't able to talk. She was not timid, but she was expressing her with a patchwork, which was much more eloquent of thousands of words yeah. on one hand. The second hand is art is very useful and beneficial for the word because it sees father, so it sees things either before or longer See. than the rest. In Olivetti, in the 50s, um, when the, the company was expanding, he uh, was building new buildings for the company, uh, which were called extensions. The fourth extensions was commissioned to a Neapolitan artist, and he had the only stupid, no, it's not stupid, simple intuition to substitute the roof with a glass. So it was the first factory in the world where workers were working with sunlight and not with artificial light. So they were much more motivated, happy, and the quality of product was, of course, rising, and the prices were rising. So there is a chain in which, that's why I'm obsessed with, with the idea, money is not a goal, but a, an effect. Mm. If you are consistent in the, in the substance of what you do, money will come, but it's not a problem. Mm. It's quite natural. Mm. The point is the artists, designers, actually see things that you don't see. see. And more than design, also, if I wouldn't uh, be so much uh, careful about dividing them into mm. two uh, separate boxes, mm. but certainly designers are the idea also of combining the uh, representation of the self on one hand see. and the functionality yeah, on the other. Absolutely. So it works perfectly because they are even more aware than artists. I mean, they are quicker than us. Yeah, artists are will be digested yeah. as lower. So as I guess what time. I was strategically combating was the university's idea, I hate this, but I'll, that art is the frill on the bonnet, not the bonnet. That it's the icing on the cake, not the cake. I hate this. I always say art's not the, the icing, it's the cake. Come on. Exactly. But exactly. I was combating this idea by adding design and then it was, I hate, relatively inexpensive to teach, you know, because we have glass studios and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, and somehow in their tiny minds, <laughs> I, you could add this and all of a sudden, oh, it became, oh, very uh, useful, yeah? Um, mm. But you know what, you, you remember, any of us know the um, trial Brancusi versus United States? See. There. And the last, yeah. the, the three motivations were the two, the first two ones were actually obsolete and typical legal kind of view. But the third was wonderful. It was useless, as it's useless. It's not the, the, the for, formal yes. sentence was not devoted to any practical purpose. Yes. Which implies the idea that art, like culture, like love, being useless is indispensable yeah. because it tracks the difference between animals and humans. Okay, this is it. 
with also some negative implications. For example, animals eat you only if they're hungry. Men <laughs> eat you because they're afraid of you. Yeah. So <laughs> we have, yeah. there is also a stupid bit of that. But certainly, it, but it's interesting to imagine that at the university, which is universitas, means everything, so it's a multidimensional yeah, thing by definition, by yeah. etymological definition, we should be really able to inoculate the virus so often don't fall into the conventional trap and say things out of the box. This is a very interesting issue about the cake and the chariot. And, and the, status, <coughs> yes. the status we hold in the university. Yeah. Oh, oh, you're in medicine. Oh, are you in art? Oh. No. <laughs> <laughs> it's wrong. Yeah. Imagine it's like, me. As oh, a... my God, oh, the baby like... balls. Yeah? Yeah. It's boring. It's boring. <laughs> and I always said to my staff, never become a victim. Never yeah. become a victim. I mean, yeah. as an economist, economist of the arts, I've been... Taken as a stupid person for 20 years. Uh, no. But I mean, people not even able to talk in Italian, but they were in some way saying, economists of the arts, what's this? Yeah. Are you totally stupid, yeah. totally useless. Yeah. I don't, know. Yeah. don't worry, we will win. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Done. Yeah, yeah. Big <laughs> <laughs>